All right, well, welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. Um, we are now doing remote support Active Teaching Labs, and it's working with the Division Continuing Studies and um, do an academic technology, doing the regular Active Teaching Labs, and we've merged them into this sort of online format. Um, welcome. I think Karen Spader, you're here with us, and you're going to run through the beginning slides. Is that correct? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so today's topic is lecturing and alternatives. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that we, a couple of messages up, John shared a link to an activity sheet. Um, we've put that together uh, to kind of keep with the spirit of the tradition of active teaching labs. Um, we have just a little bit of a kind of kind of different structure, I suppose. Um, we're going to talk about what's at the top of the, that activity sheet, the top five takeaways here at the beginning, um, and then we will turn back to that. So uh, you're welcome to look at it now or hold on tight. Uh, we I will the wrong one. Oh, did you? I the link. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, well, hold on. Forget that. forget that link. I'm gonna, here, there's a better link right here. <laughs> my, my bad. Too many tabs open. Too many activity sheets open. Uh, okay, so the second one there then. It should yeah. be about lecturing and alternatives. So um, so if we could just get a quick show of hands from everybody so we can assess how comfortable are you with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra? Have you been in here before? Raise your hand if you have and are generally comfortable with the tools available. All right, we look like we have nearly everybody. Uh, thank you. So you can lower your hand if you want now. Um, so just as a reminder, post questions that you have in that chat over there. Um, you can also post them on that activity sheet, but we will be coming back to that after our brief presentation. Okay, so um, we'll also be using the annotation tools at the top left of your screen, uh, just up here above the slides. And just so you know, the microphone and the video, if you want to engage with us at some point. So we're generally kind of going to ask, if you want to speak, please raise your hand so that we can call on you. Um, and we want everyone to be involved. This is about you. We've kind of got some overview of the topic, but uh, it's all about sharing and, and, and supporting each other. So don't be afraid to speak up. So we'll spend a few minutes here talking about the overview, the top five takeaways, and then we'll look at what your concerns and questions are and try to address those and point you toward resources that will be helpful for you. So John, you want me to keep going with this one? All right, well, I, I got the nod. I saw the nod, but I think he's muted. Keep going. <laughs> So let's get started just by hearing from you here. Um, on this slide, you can use the click on that T up there and to the right, a color bubble will pop up so you could change the color if you wanted. If you'd take just a minute to share what concerns you have about lecturing in the remote learning environment and or concerns you have about finding alternatives to lectures. So I'll spend a few minutes letting you post those. So we've got using media, video, and narrative, okay. Uh, lecturing in and of itself. How to keep the pace going when you've got technical connection disruptions, great point. One and a half syndrome. Encouraging student participation or presentations, great. Recording content for viewing later. Best tool for narrated PowerPoints. Uh, maintaining connection. How do I know my students can access integrated technologies? Uh, whiteboard capabilities. Best tool for near. Oh, I already read that one. <laughs> Finding media that is relevant to what my lecture objective goal is. Awesome. All right. So a lot. some of these are tech-related, best tools. Um, but a lot of these are really about creating 
ultimately creating lecture content, and I'll use that as a very general term because I think we could we'll, we'll look at some of the ways we can do that in a variety of formats, not just a video recorded lecture. Um, so it's really kind of about you know how to make quality lecture materials, so to speak. Um, and regarding this one here down at the bottom on assessments, um, we have a topic on assessments tomorrow. So today we're keeping the focus on uh, de designing, developing, delivering remote lecture material um, and what kinds of alternatives are available for that. So I will point the person who wrote assessments to come to us tomorrow if you can. And if you can't, we will record it and share it. And then assessments, what's the cycle like, John? Uh, assessments will be Tuesday next week. Am I right on that? You're muted. Yes, next week we're doing the same topics, but we're rotating them by one date forward. So assessments will be Tuesday, and then what was last Tuesday will be Wednesday, and then what was last, what was yesterday will be Thursday. It's all very confusing in my brain when I talk about it before coffee. <laughs> but if the days of the week were a clock, we rotate clockwise, Tuesday yes. to Friday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so lots of really great ideas here. John, do you want to take this one? Sure, I could take this one. Um, one of the things that we're doing this week or with these formats is um, oftentimes on the activity sheets, we start off at the very top with the top five takeaways, electron and alternatives. And again, in the chat, you can see that. Oh, I think I've got it right there. You can get to that sheet where these five top takeaways are um, added to a little bit more. So as we talk through them, um, you can see even more information about it. But they're kind of simple, but a little bit different. So we've always said, chunk your lectures, right? When you have a lecture, don't lecture for the full 15 minutes. Lecture for five to seven minutes, and then have some sort of an activity or some sort of an act of learning, or let the students stop and reflect. The same thing is true here in a, a remote teaching environment. Um, and even if it's not synchronous, even if you have recordings that the students can um, work on in, in smaller chunks, uh, then they can, it, it's, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm stuttering here a little bit. By having the sections or the videos smaller, the student download op abilities are easier because it's much easier to download a five to seven minute chunk than it is a 50 minute chunk. Even more so to download a two to three minute chunk. So think at the micro level with what content you want your students to stop and, and to work on and when you, they should stop and reflect on it. And if you think about this, um, think about a hard book that you've read. Um, Oftentimes, you don't read the whole book and then say, well, what did I think about that book? You might read a paragraph and be like, wow, what, what just happened in that paragraph? How long did it take you to read that paragraph or that page before you stopped and thought about it? Do the same thing with your lecture and other alternative activities. Don't make it so long that they have to think about um, or that they have to go too far before they stop and think about what happened and, and apply the knowledge um, to whatever the situation is. So that's the first one. The second one, incorporate outside resources. We've got a great opportunity in this um, face-to-face, uh, sorry, in the remote online environment to have other resources that you can't bring into your classroom very easily. So take advantage of it. Get experts to present, um, have guest speakers, connect with uh, other classes and or other countries and have some sort of um, pen pal opportunities, etc. cetera, um, through a digital domain. Uh, the third one, provide alternatives whenever possible. And this goes back to universal design for learning. Think again about what your students are facing as they are isolating and um, Maybe they're sharing a computer with their little brother who needs it or sister who needs it for their K-12 schooling. Um, and there's only a couple of computers or one computer in the in the house that, you know, at their family's house. Um, so can they use it all the time? Do they need to um, 
take over that computer or, or can you do can you give them things to do that um, allow for flexibility there show your personality and, and this is the reason that I'm asking you to um, get rid of the little gray icons in your in blackboard collaborate here and replace them with your face a photo of your face um, we're all people and in a face-to-face -face classroom we don't you know hide behind these avatar masks we we're able to see each other and humans need in some ways to see each other um, at least in, in standard uh, uh, in Western culture we do um, in order to recognize each other's humanity a little bit more um, so encourage your students to share things about their lives and model that by sharing things about your own life and your personality um, both in the audio and video that you do and then try new ways to use the utilize video again this is sort of like the outs, uh, incorporate outside resources provide demonstrations walkthroughs virtual tours um, have expert guest speakers what can't you or what couldn't you do in a face-to-face -face environment that you can now do here so those are sort of our top five takeaways, and they are by no means the top five takeaways ever in the world. Uh, they will evolve. There are probably some that we've missed here. Um, so please, on the activity sheet, add to, add to that what specifically would you like us to talk to and to talk about and to address um, either about those topics or about other topics that we haven't, um, that aren't in those five takeaways. And you can do that in the Google Sheet that we've shared in the chat. Do any questions come up right away that people are um, curious about? If so, go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, also, I should say, in the what do you want to learn section of the activity sheet, um, as soon as you answer, we're going to have people jump in. I'm sorry, as soon as you ask the question, we're going to have people jump in with some suggestions. These are not the ultimate authoritative answers necessarily, but they're just some suggestions. If you have other suggestions, please add to those answers yourself. Share your ideas. What, what have you seen that has worked and have not, has not worked? Um, we're putting our answers in bold to sort of differentiate from the questions, and uh, we'll continue to try to do that. Again, not the authoritative, the one right answer, but just one answer. Erica, Fry, go ahead. Um, is there a FAQ for um, faculty or presenters for recording a lecture PowerPoint um, conference that's um, available already I assume there is but because um, we're gonna do some format that way yeah so we have on the farther down on that activity sheet we have some how to's as well so we've got some easy things so if you've never done um, any sort of remote teaching before here are some easy things that you could first try um, we've got some medium things so if you've done a few things and you're feeling good the easy things um, there's some challenges for you to at sort of a medium level um, and we have some advanced things so that if you feel like you've got the hang of all of those things there are some um, challenges for you at the advanced level some of which we don't even know the answer to or how to do them ourselves but we put them in like somebody's gonna know how to do this so let's ask them to do it um, and then below that you'll see a whole section on resources um, that have uh, tips and connections to our knowledge base documents um, Etc. Go ahead. That's actually great. Um, the other question I have, um, since I don't technically, I mean, I can create a course, how do I enroll students who aren't technically students? In Canvas, you cannot do that. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong about that, but I believe that that is a, you can. So what if they're um, fellows, honorary fellows, because they're hospital employed? You can't, um, let's see. Somebody just raised their hand. Somebody knows the answer to that. JT knows the answer to that. Go ahead, JT. Hey, Erica. I think you can add them as a teacher 
um, you won't be able to add them as a principal instructor because I think that determination is made by the registrar, but there are different permissions. Um, I'll post a link in the chat about how to change some of those and hopefully they work for you. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. All right, did I see Cliff has a hand raised? Go ahead, Cliff. I uh, just wanted to clarify, was that a request about how to add uh, not like a, but uh, I mean, there are lots of there. There are a couple of various ways of adding people to courses. Are you just wanting them to be involved as part of the recording, or do you actually want to add them to the course? So, um, for instance, our faculty um, who are both appointed or paid by the med school and the uh, hospital would be considered faculty and easy to add as an instructor. Um, the residents and fellows I work with are given honorary fellow appointments, so they do have net IDs, but we don't have a course that's related to the institution as far as the UW Canvas side. So that's who I want to enroll to participate in course content and be able to um, access like a recorded, pre-recorded lecture or similar. Well, I, I sure don't want to speak out of turn or speak with too much authority, but just know that there's a lot of uh, a lot of FERPA considerations about adding people who are not actually instructors, not actually involved in the true instruction of that course, adding them to a course so that they get access to students and student content. If you add them as teachers, they're going to have the full-blown access to grades and all student submissions and all kinds of stuff. And I would just encourage you to talk to the registrar's office to, to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Thank you, that's helpful. All right. So let's start looking at some of those questions that we have. Uh, the difference between uploading a narrated PowerPoint directly to Canvas and uploading its MP4 export to Kaltura Media Space and linking that to the Canvas page. So this is a, a, a really good um, question. Do any of our moderators or folks um, feel like they want to speak to that? If not, I can. Arjean. Yeah, correct me if, I wrong, if I'm wrong, but I think one of the main considerations to, to think about is and we talked about this yesterday, right, that um, there's <clears throat> that content takes up space. And it sounds like we have two gigs of space in uh, Canvas. Is that true now instead of one that gig? That is true. It's, it's been doubled. Okay. So um, I don't know how long it takes for videos to take up two gigs of space, but uh, putting it up in Kaltura means there's less of an issue with not having space in the Canvas course itself. Lauren, go ahead. So the other consideration, and I and I agree with with um, what's been said so far, is what are you going to do with that video? What sort of concept check are you going to provide for your students, and in what technology would that happen? So, for example, if you do create it as a video and you're using some resource that allows you to do pop-up questions. You can do that in a video, but you can't do that in just the voiceover PowerPoint, if I'm not mistaken. That, that is correct. The voiceover PowerPoint, as I understand it, the voiceover PowerPoints, and I have not done a lot of these, so that's a big disclaimer. The only way to export it is as an MP4 video, correct? Haley? Yeah, so I believe that's correct, John. And I was just going to chime in that I read the question as um, the first option being a narrated PowerPoint that's not exported, like it's uploaded to Canvas as a PPTX file and would require a download of that by every student to view on their computer, which yeah. I think is probably not a good would agree is um, not a very easy way for students to consume the content compared to a video. Correct. Yeah. It anytime that you now more than ever asking the students to download PDFs to view them or download um, 
files to their PowerPoint, assuming that they have PowerPoint on their phone, for example. Um, some do, some don't. Some have never figured that out. Um, or on the computer that their parents have at home, um, maybe rural Wisconsin, the parents don't have uh, the wisc.edu PowerPoint on their computer, um, the way that the students had in the labs that they used in their residence halls. So think about accessibility there. Are there simpler options that you can have here? Um, just about. So, and that's where Canvas, I guess, is, is if it can be seen on Canvas, that's sort of a safe bet that you're not asking them to invest in additional software um, or hardware, I guess, because Canvas can play on their mobile device, it can play on their um, any web browser just about. So that's a, a concern. And then Kaltura plays through Canvas. So does that help answer that question? Other thoughts on that question, anyone? I, I don't have a question. I just wanted to add, I suppose that Box is another tool um, that you can link through, link into Canvas. You can embed a video from Box into Canvas. Um, so if Box is um, something you're more comfortable with, uh, I just want to point out that that's another tool. Very good. All right. Does Box require download? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by require. Uh, you could pull an embed code from a video that you've uploaded to Box and drop that embed code into Canvas directly, um, in which case it would not require download. Could you use it download? OK, great. Yes. Yep, you could. You can use Box as a download if you just add the link to it. Um, but it's you could also embed it so that it's not necessary. Good. Uh, shall we move on to number two? And we've got some great answers on this already. What are the best low tech options for someone who's new to the online and learning environment? That's a that's a big question. Um, so keeping it simple, I think, is probably uh, your best idea. And I'm going to answer. Two is actually several questions, so let me just focus on the first one. Uh, Low-tech option, for you and the students, just having them go to Canvas is a good idea. Um, once they get comfortable with it, then you can start to incorporate perhaps some other things that are used in Canvas. Um, integrating surveys for quick polling is the second question in that and I think that a good answer for that um, we've got already Google Forms is a very simple way to build quick polls those are embedded very nicely into Canvas and it's a it's a UW uh, supported tool with um, the Google Suite so it's a tool in Google Suite the G Suite so it's it's available there plus a lot of the students have already been using the Google tools in their K-12 education. Many, many schools across the country are Google schools right now. They use Google Classroom and Gmail, and um, they're already familiar with those for your students. So um, if you learn how to use them and they're simple, that would be a, another easy way to do that. What is the other question? We've got resource here as well. Ungraded surveys, yeah, there's another one. Ungraded surveys, that's again, that's actually easier because that's in Canvas. So under the quizzes, you have you can give graded quizzes, but you can also give ungraded quizzes and they call those uh, surveys, even though it's under the quiz tool. All right, any other questions, thoughts on, on question number two, questions in number two? Anyone, moderators? Participants. Nope, nobody, no thoughts. All right, shall we head over to question number three? Uh, best practices for accessibility in the online lecture space. 
Um, accessibility, we've got several options here with accessibility, right? Um, on the one hand, we can talk about um, captions. On the other hand, uh, let's see. And we've got a good answer here already. Again, looking at that um, top takeaways using other answers or using other options. Um, if the, the transcripts are already there, fantastic. That means you don't have to create them yourself. Um, if they are not there or if it's your own lecture that you're uploading, it's good practice to um, create those. One way to do that is to, um, the simplest way maybe to do that is to just follow a script. So a lot of instructors are very good at this point at um, outlining what they're gonna say and then just following that outline um, as they talk and that way they've got their caption pretty much done. Um, and it doesn't include extra little thoughts and takeaways, but I think that that's okay. Haley, you had a question or just point. Mm -hmm. in, yeah, thanks. Um, I was just gonna get to the last part of that question, which is image descriptions. Um, so right. transcripts and captions are kind of like the banner answer to video accessibility, but keep in mind any visuals you embed in your PowerPoint or if you screen share, you're going to want to verbally explain them really thoroughly, if not um, put text descriptions elsewhere on the page just to ensure that the visual content can be consumed by someone who might have a visual impairment. Mm -hmm. Oh, and my Blackboard Collaborate is telling me I'm running out of memory, so I need to reload, so I'll be back in just a minute. Okay, I'm um, not sure why all of a sudden that stopped sharing, but I'm going to bring that screen back up for us over here. Okay, there we go. Okay, so yes, Cliff, go ahead. Um, that very episode that just happened with John. I've never heard of that. Uh, is that something you all could explain or elaborate on? What does yeah. it mean, Blackboard memory? I have no idea. I've never heard that either. So we'll have to okay. have him fill us in on that. Okay. So this has happened to me several times throughout in the past couple of weeks. And I don't know exactly what it is, but um, I get a little banner across the top of my um, across the top of my screen that says, you don't have enough memory to share anymore, or your looks like your connection is bad. We're gonna, we recommend that you reload. And it may be because I've got several tabs open on my computer. Um, it probably is that, but my computer just isn't powerful enough to run it very well. And if it happens to me and I've got a, you know, a pretty nice computer uh, MacBook from 2017, so it's not super old right now, and it's got a lot of memory, or it did at least at the time. Um, so if that happens with me, then that might happen with other people as well. Go ahead, Cliff. And that's, uh, I do not deny you your experience, John, but that has never happened to me. So I don't know if people are hearing this for the first time, take that into consideration. I also haven't been a, doing as many as you have either, John, so. You've got a Dell, right? I was actually gonna make a joke about it. Maybe you should get a PC, but I wasn't going to do that. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Cold, dead hands. JT. Haley, thanks for that information about the um, image descriptions. I was wondering if you could give some more advice about actually the, ex the, the most appropriate or the most accessible way to make a video recording. Um, is it sort of, you know, the blank background or are there any types of sort of um, orientation of the image descriptions that you should take, or orientation of the of the screen that you should take into account, um, length of sentences or cadence in speech, if those sort of more production um, considerations come into play um, when creating those videos, even if they're three or five minutes. Wow, um, those are really good considerations. I guess I don't have um, immediate ideas, but 
I think in general with accessibility, if you can just imagine, you know, what what would make it easiest for you to learn or for, you know, just the average student to consume um, the audio and visual uh, visual content, you know, so definitely speaking slower than you might want to, especially in recordings, um, maybe not having too much content um, for each slide, moving from slide to slide a little bit faster. Um, I'll try and think of more in the chat. I don't want to ramble on, but those are really great considerations. There is a, um, under resources here, I want to point out under accessibility, uh, the Center for Digital Accessibility and, and UX team in Do It here has put together a very nice um, web page on video and audio content, creating that accessible. So that is a, that is a nice thing. There's also, I've heard, and this is sort of in the speculative space, um, Microsoft Teams has live captioning for some people, and it is a thing I'm told that is currently being propagated or rolled out across campus. So I do not have access to it, but several of my um, colleagues do already have access to it, and I am told that the captioning or live transcripts is excellent on that. Uh, I don't think that it's excellent means that it's up to accessibility standards, but I believe that it means that it's a great point to start to take that, download it, and then um, edit it um, to make it even better that you can then share. I don't know if other people have any information or news on that. Um, I know that it's getting rolled out. And Microsoft Teams is not a tool that we have traditionally talked about um, or encouraged people to use in teaching. Um, it has been sort of on the back end, on the administrative side of things. And so we're not saying go out and teach with Microsoft Teams, but we know that some people are using it because it allows for a lot of features um, that people are saying that they need. So I think that there will be more happening with that. And because it has good captioning, allegedly, I haven't seen it again, um, that might be a big push to make more people use it. All right. How about best practice? Oh, we already did that one. Number four, slides or no slides. Um, what about a podcast as an alternative to a narrative um, PowerPoint? I think that's fantastic. Um, anytime you can do a podcast without that extra visual element, you are making it so much easier for your students because they can go out on a walk, socially distance themselves on that walk, plug it in the, to their headphones and play with their dog and look at the sky and pause and stop and think about it with you know their phone, pause, stop and think, Has, what was that question? Great, do a podcast, podcasts are great. Um, other thoughts from other people? Yeah, Cliff. For instructors who may be new to this world um, of online presentations um, delivering remotely, I have personally been surprised by how many instructors are at opting for the non-synchronous uh, or the asynchronous delivery. Instead of trying to have your traditional class with like 30 or 40 attendees, just record your video or record your audio, record your lecture, and create them as standalone objects that students can get to on their own. It, uh, it's, very, it's interesting and it does answer a lot of issues about ex access and timing and technical disruptions and keeping the flow. So. And there is something with multiple means of, rep of representation, right? For the universal design for learning, we know that, that the more senses that are engaged by your students in, I'm, I hate this term, absorbing your content, but ingesting, um, getting the content, if they can see it and hear it, that's better than if they just see it. If they see it, hear it, and smell it, that's even better. If they can see it, hear it, smell it, and like manipulate it, that's fantastic. So podcasts are just hearing. And honestly, personally, I've never been a big one for podcasts. I know my friends love them, and they're like, oh my gosh, you've got to listen to this one. But I, 
I have my own thoughts going on in my head that whenever words are in my brain, I, I either filter them out because I want my own words. Um, so your mileage might vary. It's a great option for some, but not a best option for all. Marjean, please go ahead. <clears throat> John, you kind of uh, made some of the points I wanted to make about multi multimodal. And just to point out, um, and this happens in any sort of lecture situation, whether it's live or has visual or, or what have you, is that students can be a little bit overconfident hearing something, processing it in the moment, and not to you, and and actually retaining that information. So, I think the podcast is awesome. I think it needs to have some contextualization or some practice or some application time too. Um, just because I just know when I listen to a podcast because I love podcasts, I will have amazing ideas, and I know I've gotten to the office before and said. I don't even know why, where I heard this or what this podcast, I don't remember the details of it. So um, I get a little overconfident myself when I listen to that podcast. So can I ask a follow-up question for that um, before we jump to Karen, Marjean? Um, and that is when you, do you ever find yourself with podcasts, you have the idea, but then two minutes later in the podcast, you have another idea um, from it and then you've forgotten that first idea? Mm -hmm. I feel like podcasts are one of those really long things that you don't, going back to that early point of small chunks, um, podcasts are generally much longer. So unless you have the breaks within the podcast to stop and do something else or write it down or reflect on what you just heard, it can be a, a, a challenge to keep track of all of the things in it. Yeah, part of my issue is that I'm doing this, I'm listening to it when I'm moving around or on walks or multitasking usually, right? So I haven't, I don't sit down and take notes on it like I might in an actual lecture or I might, um, if I broke it into chunks and there was a checkpoint where I needed to answer some questions before going on. So that could be a really interesting idea too, is breaking things up. Yeah. Go ahead, Karen. You were going to have something or... Yes, I just wanted to mention what I also mentioned to instructors, not about podcasts because I don't do those a lot, but I have a lot of instructors uh, who I talk to that are very concerned about doing videos because they're worried that it won't be perfect. And I always like to let them know that that's great and that's fine because showing your personal touch, showing that you're a human is more important. And when things go wrong, sometimes that's even better having your dog join you, for example, while you're on a video or before before all of this happened, I would always film when I was on trips, like was in, in uh, New Orleans or Las Vegas, but I can't do that now. So wherever I would go, I, mean, I might have to do it in front of my fireplace here at, at home or something. But having the personal touch and showing that you're human and not worrying that it's perfect, those are the videos that, that students really love. You don't have to be perfect. So I just want to say that that was one of the, I put that key point at the top, is to show your personality, show that you're human. And, and it, that's more important to students, especially now, because I'm hearing a lot from students that they feel very distanced with all of these different courses that are now online. So showing that personal touch, it really means a lot to students. So I just wanted to share that. I always say in, in active teaching labs, we, we model making mistakes all the time so that instructors say, oh, it's okay to do that. And I've been to training sessions that are, are and tech, tech uh, instructional technology sessions that are so perfect and flawless that I look at them and I'm like, wow, that must have taken so much work. I don't have the kind of work or expertise to be able to do this. That's not for me. I need something that they can be successful in making mistakes. Um, I'm so good at modeling say, that too, John. Yeah, right. It labs we model mistakes. Yeah. JT. Go ahead, JT. Hey, one thing I was thinking of is using podcasts maybe just as an extracurricular type thing, sort of you know, missives from the field or as a way to connect with students with sort of course related um, conversations. And I was wondering if anyone has any experience with students um, submitting those types of um, assignments or podcasts as sort of their own, um, I don't want to say meanderings, but their own thoughts about, you know, French in the world and my life currently at home, that type of thing. Having the students go find examples of what's happening in your course and their own world and their podcasts and web pages. That's awesome. Other, do any, does anyone do that? Have a story they'd like to share about that? Lauren, is that? 
Is your go ahead, Lauren? If oh, um, if nobody else wants to jump in, it, you can. It wasn't change your... about. It was actually kind of related to the previous. Great. Thing that jump in then. Was simply that um, if we show our humanness and our mistakes, when students are creating those things for us, they'll be more comfortable with their own mistakes and humanness. So yeah. if they see 100% perfection from us, then that kind of raises the anxiety level for them that there's this higher expectation. You've set the bar here if it's perfect. Right. Yeah. Excellent point. Marjean, go ahead. I really like JT's uh, suggestion of students, and I think we all would love students to produce these things as well. And going beyond podcasts. Producers are fine. Yeah. What was it? <laughs> Just creating Producers their own. Producers are fine. Right, exactly, artifacts. Um, you asked for a little story, and I know you, you uh, many of you might know this, but I've um, used the app Sifter for st and given students little tasks to go take pictures, write captions, um, to go and whatever we're talking about, find examples or out in the world. Obviously, you have to do this with social distancing again, but it's really interesting to see how they interpret what you're thinking about or talking about um, and and finding it in their own world. The reason I really like that is because it becomes a top of mind experience, right? So if they have to, if they're thinking like, gosh, I have to complete this assignment, they're thinking about your class beyond the classroom, right? They're walking around with their phone in their pocket and they might see something and all of a sudden <clears throat> they are, they're back to thinking about what they just learned or were thinking about or discussing in class. Sorry, I think I need coffee too, I'm rambling, <laughs> sorry. That's all right. Okay, so, and I don't know if Sifter actually still exists. I just uh, added the link to it, but it does not seem to be loading, so maybe that doesn't work anymore. But yeah, I, I was just thinking about the idea of uh, one of the options in the activity sheet for alternatives under easy advanced here, there are lots of them here, right, that we can try out. A lot of them I don't know what they are. A lot of them I just looked up um, in, uh, in creating this. But one of them was um, field trips and virtual field trips. And obviously you can't do a big class field trip, but maybe you can have your students do individual and hyper-local field trips where, you know, within the 300 meters of their houses or their apartments that they're able to go to these days while social isolating, um, can they find examples of what you're teaching um, in, you know, because that's their classroom, that's their lived world. They are no longer on campus, but where are they? And can they find examples in their world? All right, there's a, there's a side conversation in the chat that I wanna bring up. Um, and that was Heidi and Haley, you were talking about surveying your students. Can I get the two of you to jump in and tell us what you're talking about? Heidi, go ahead. Hi, sure. So I work with international students who are very desperate to return to their countries. And so I just started. I used a Google Docs survey first, a Google Form survey, to find out where they were, what kind of equipment they had, uh, if they could access Canvas and Google Docs. And with things changing so quickly, I have surveyed them repeatedly, but I found it was just a little bit easier for me to just send an email and have them reply to it than to um, keep sending the Google Docs. And I got a better response rate when I sent it through email anyway. So that yeah. could be a quick and dirty way to find out where your students are. And that can be a, a, a Canvas uh, survey. That'd be a great example of a Canvas survey. Um, or a, one of the things that we've been talking about lately is um, with many of our international students going back to China, um, China has uh, a relationship with Google that does not allow a lot of the Google tools to work very well. Um, so keeping things out of Google is actually really good if you have Chinese students um, 
and I expect that there are other countries in the world that have um, similar um, relationships with different tools where some of them are allowed and some of them are not allowed or are, are thank you for the diplomatic way to put it out relationships. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not surprised that more answered in the email than they did um, on the Google Doc, um, especially if you had international or Chinese students. Um, other people have thoughts about that? And maybe this is the, the number one tip that we should have put on the very top of the page as far as a, a top five takeaways. Ask your students what they can do. We've been talking about this throughout the week, um, and this idea keeps coming up. We don't know about our students. We just don't. We see them in classes sometimes. Now we don't even see them in classes, but we don't know what they can do, what they can't do, what they grumble about, because they won't grumble to us, right, because of the power dynamic. But is there a way to anonymously get their input on what works for them, what doesn't work for them? What are they seeing in other other classes that they're taking that really works for them that they wish you would do as well, but you don't know about it. So how can you do it? Ask them about those things. Heidi, go ahead. I just wanted to add that when students responded, uh, it resulted in a couple of back and forth emails of how are you doing? How's everything going? Uh, and so that kind of personal um, correspondence that took place afterwards, I think made them feel like they were more connected to their instructor and that someone cared about them, especially yeah. for the students who are stuck in the dorms right now without knowing when they're going home. That's all. Yeah, all of these social isolation uh, precautions that we're taking have sort of flipped the script, I, I think, for a lot of people who are like, oh, can we please just do this online? Do we have to meet face to face? And now they're like, I need to see people. I, you know, even some of the more, I don't, I don't want to speak for introverts, but I suspect that even some of the introverts are missing people, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Any other thoughts on that topic of asking the students? And then going back to the chat, we're talking a little bit more about uh, virtual museums now or virtual field trips. Um, JT, go ahead with your thoughts. Yeah, Heidi, I was just going to ask you, what do you, what are some of the ways that you've been responding to students who have encountered serious difficulties? How have you adapted your ability to engage with them? Okay, and then so, with you as well. Mm -hmm. So right now, I only have one student who is unable to access anything because he's in quarantine. And for him, I just tried to reassure him not to panic, but once he exits quarantine uh, and has access to Canvas, we will skip some of the homework assignments that he's missed and just kind of pick up uh, where we are at this point and that I will extend deadlines, uh, but that I'm not going to expect him to make up everything that he's missed because that would be really overwhelming. So I think lowering, changing your expectations for what students have missed, um, extending deadlines and offering reassurances that just because they couldn't access something means that they're going to fail the course or an assignment. Does that help? It, it does. It, yeah, and I think that, go ahead, JT. I was going to say it sort of allows us to continue to a portion of the conversation that we had yesterday about how do you, or, you know, questions over the flexibility that you can build into your rubric and sort of I don't want to say contingency plan, but this is sort of a contingency issue um, in dealing with that. So it's great to hear that um, from you, Heidi. I can imagine if you have 500 students, that question or those issues would be um, much more fraught with problems. But you know, on an individual level, it sounds great. Yeah, flexibility. I mean, we all need it right now, I think, a little bit because we don't know what's happening in their houses. And um, you had mentioned, Heidi, early on in the chat, their situations change. So, you know, they might be great right now, but next week something might have happened. So continually making those connections um, and it's, it's a human connection. It's part of, part of being an instructor, part of being a teacher. All right, we've got the session standard is to go till 1130.
However, um, we don't have to go to 11.30. And we were thinking, we were just discussing today that maybe we would just make this an hour and then have that second, uh, that last half hour from 11 to 11.30 um, be focused on people who have some of the more technical questions on how to do things. Any thoughts on that from any of the participants or other moderators? Are there topics that we'd like to talk a little bit more about in the last six minutes before 11? I want to call out, um, Chris has put together a, a, a very nice section on problem-based learning, and that is one option in this that could be a lecture alternative instead of, you know, online or individual work is a lot maybe more suited for people who are socially isolated. Um, letting them do small group work where they figure out how to connect with each other um, synchronously in a small group rather than, you know, all 30 or all 80 people in your classes together. Um, it's easier for them to work individual or in smaller groups. So that could be where the synchronous work happens. Karen, go ahead, jump in. Um, yeah, I just wanted to also point out that this, I just put a link to the page on content and sharing in our remote readiness course. This is from way back that those first round of webinars, webinars that, that we did. did. Oh, sorry, I've got feedback there. Um, anyway, it's from the first round of webinars, and we have a lot of resources on that page. Um, there's a document embedded, and you can also open it and download it for yourself. But in there, we've got a variety of other um, links to how-to things, other ideas, um, yeah, a lot of stuff that's in there. So please feel free to to visit that and take from it what you would like. Um, I thought, huh? I thought I had something in there that I don't see right now, but I can look into that later. It's uh, it's not relevant for right now anyway. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, All right and I'm going you to talking. stop. The, uh, should I stop the recording then now? So. Sure. Should I stop? I'm going to stop the recording so anyone can ask whatever they want and it won't be recorded.